Father, thank you for bringing us today. Thank you for the sunshine. Thank you for the food and thank you for the word of God. Lord, feed our hearts and our spirits that we may grow in you. Amen. Thank you all for coming once again. Hopefully the noise will drop down in a while. In front of you, you'll see some notes. You'll also see some new bookmarks. And I took, took a lesson from what I was told last time. It's actually got the dates of the meetings on the bookmarks as well. Um, this time, so hopefully people don't have to keep asking me and hopefully I can find out myself when we're actually meeting in future. Because I usually forgot as well. Um, there's 10 dates there for the whole year. One of the third Sundays turned out to be Easter Sunday. And I thought as an August we're on holiday anyway, I left it at 10. So if we want to meet another one before Easter or after Easter, we can obviously arrange that if you wanted to do it. What I'm going to start this time is a little subject called the life of Jesus. So what I want to do is take everything we've done so far. So if you look on the backs of those bookmarks, um, those of you who are here will see that the, the rules that I taught you for the interpretation of the Bible. Uh, I won't go over them again now, but I want to take those. I want to take the concept of taking the Old Testament and attaching it to the New Testament to make it understandable. Um, and the various other things like the covenants we've looked at, the dispensations and things like that, and bring it all together in what is the most important story in the entire Bible. In fact, it is the story of the Bible. And as you will see as we start, the story of Jesus does not start in the New Testament. It starts a lot earlier, and it does not finish with his, with his um, ascension. It carries on right the way to Revelations, and then beyond Revelations. Which we don't know about yet, but we'll get to that when we get there. So let us start. Let's turn to the book of Luke to start with. Now there's four what we call Gospels in the, the Bible. So there are four, uh, all, uh, four biographies of Jesus. If we look at the book of Luke, he's the one that sets it out most systematically, if you like. So we'll start reading at verse 1. So Luke 1, verse 1. I'm reading from the New American Standard, by the way. Everyone's got different versions, and I, if you've got a different version, excellent. Tony's got the ones with all the answers in. He's not allowed to use it. Right. Insomuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, having hand handed down to them, it seemed fitting to me as well, having investigated all things carefully from the beginning, to write it out in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you might un know the exact truth about the things that you have been taught. Welcome ladies, that's all right. That's the idea of the four Gospels. So that initially in the church, when the church was all in Jerusalem, you had a, an apostle, the Apostle Peter, who could sit you all down and tell you about the life of Jesus. Or the Apostle John. But when the church started to spread, they then had to start writing these uh, Gospels, these letters to send out to people, so that if you've never met an apostle, you've never sat down, you had some sort of account of the life of Jesus. Otherwise, what you get is stories handed down, apocryphal stories. So there's a whole load of apocryphal stories written about Jesus' life as a child and things like that, that all get added in. So they wanted to make an authoritative set of things that you need to know. Now there's a problem with this, and the problem comes in the end of John. So if you want to turn, turn to the end of John, this verse, chapter 21. Last verse, I think. Now this is the, the apostle who wrote the book of John. 
and he's writing at the end of his book. And this is the last of the uh, Gospels to be written. This is the disciple who bears witness of these things and wrote these things. This is verse 24, by the way, sorry. Um, and we know that his witness is true. And there... Oh, I've gone from the wrong verse, sorry. Hold on. Yep, 25 it is, sorry. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which, were, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain all the books that were written. So if that's true... And I'm assuming he's talking poetically here. Although it has to be said, how many books have been written about the life of Jesus since this? And they're still being written. But how, in four little books, and if you look at your Gospels, if you go to the Gospel of John, go to the book, to the beginning of Matthew, that's it. That's it, and a few pages in gaps. That's everything we've got on the life of Jesus in the Bible. And you say, well, why didn't God record more? Well, what I'm going to show you, he recorded what you need to know. Now, when we start with the Gospels themselves, four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and bits of Acts. The first thing I'm going to tell you is we do not know the, the author of any of them. The names we've actually got on them are an educated guess. They are by church tradition, and they are by what we read, actually, in the, the, the Bible's work. We're taking a guess at it. But we do not know that Matthew wrote the book of Matthew, or that Mark wrote the book of Mark. So that is something that later church history has added on to these. So if it turns out it is not Matthew, but Thomas who wrote the, the, the Gospel of Matthew, I'm not overly worried about that. I will still refer to them as Matthew, Mark, Luke and John because that's what tradition says and that's what is most likely to be true and I will go from that but it, that is not gospel the name attached to it let's start off though with Matthew now if it is the character of Matthew let's turn up to Matthew chapter 9 There's two names here. Matthew would be his Greek name. And he's got another name, which is his Hebrew name, which is Levi. And so we're going to find him in chapter, or sorry, chapter 9, verse 10. Want to pick that one? Yeah. Chapter, 10, uh, chapter 9, verse 9. And as Jesus passed on from them, he came, he came upon a man called Matthew. In the book of Mark, his name is Levi, same person, <laughs> sitting at the tax office. And Jesus said to him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. So if it is this character, Matthew, he was a tax collector. Nowadays, tax collectors, we growl at them a little bit, but we pay up because it pays for the National Health Service and things like that. It wasn't quite the same in those days. Caesar would say, I want one coin from every person in my empire. His people under him would say, OK, I'll organise it, boss. OK, they'd say to their unglings, I want two coins from every person in this empire. One for Caesar, one for me. They would say to their underlings, OK, we want three coins, please. One for Caesar, one for my boss, one for me. And it would work down until you got at the bottom of the list where you got to the tax collector in the street who was collecting 10 coins, thank you very much, passing nine of them, keeping one himself. These people would have been Jews. They weren't press ganged into the job. They actually paid a bribe to the people above them in order to get the job. So on the whole, they were not very popular. Um, and this was the worst type of tax collector because it wasn't just income tax, oh, I've got to pay my yearly tax to Caesar. This was on your trading. And Jews were great traders. But if they're saying, right, I want 10% or 20% of everything you trade is going to be mine, that was even worse, because once a year, you could grumble about that. Every single day you were working, you had to pay guy stuff over to this guy. This guy was particularly hated. So when Jesus came along and said to a tax collector, sitting at the booth where you pay your taxes, come and follow me, 
there would have been certain Pharisees looking at him with contempt. Certain disciples looking at him with contempt. And when Levi got up and left his position, there would have been certain Romans looking at him with contempt. Because he has left his job that he paid for, that he paid a bribe for, that he owes money to Caesar for. So this is a big event. So it is very strange that this guy, who was held in contempt by the Jews, should be held right this particular gospel, because this particular gospel shows Jesus as the king of the Jews. You would think someone like uh, the Apostle Paul, maybe, who was a Pharisee, would be asked to do this, to explain to his fellow Pharisees why Jesus was the king of the Jews. But what, if, this, if it is Matthew, and I think it is, God has taken a despised and rejected person to explain why Jesus was the king of the Jews, and more importantly, why the king of the Jews was despised and rejected. Which is very cunning on God's part. And there's a, a question Matthew needs to answer in this. You see, to any Jew, they would say, well, if the Messiah has come, if you're telling me this guy was the Messiah, where is the promised kingdom that was promised in the rest of the Bible? Because it says, when the Messiah comes, he will set up the kingdom on earth, he will set up justice. We've been singing a whole load of things in there today about setting up justice on earth and all that type of stuff. That is supposed to have happened when the Messiah comes, as far as the Jews were concerned, and it has not happened. So to any Jew, even today, if you say to them, your Messiah has come, they will say, well, where is the kingdom? And so Matthew's, one of his main purposes is to explain the kingdom was offered, the kingdom was rejected. What happens next? And he also, there's that sections in the book that talks about the impending judgment that comes on not every Jew forevermore, but on that particular generation of Jews. Basically, after the, the rejection of Jesus, 40 years later, the temple was destroyed. As Jesus said, the blood will come upon this generation and the children. And that's what happened 40 years later. And so because they rejected their Messiah, they were given one generation to repent. They failed. The temple was destroyed. That does not refer to all Jews forever. Otherwise, what's the point of the, book, the Gospel of Matthew? What's the point of a, a gospel written effectively to Jews now if they've been rejected? But he does explain that. One of the, the symbols that has been put with the Gospel of Matthew in the past by tradition is the Lion of Judah. Because the Messiah is represented as the Lion of Judah. Because um, the King David come from the tribe of Judah. The Messiah was of the descendants of Judah. And the, the, that was referred to as the Lion, because that was the symbol of the tribe of Judah. So the Lion of Judah was the ruler of Judah. And the, the rabbis put that towards the Messiah when he comes, because the, the Bible says he will come from the tribe of Judah, he will come from the descendants of Bethlehem, he is the Lion of Judah. So tradition has always taken the symbol of the Lion to go with Matthew. So when we read the book of Matthew, that's the angle he's coming from. He's writing to Jews, he's explaining to Jews, he's explaining why the kingdom was offered, it was rejected, that one day it will be offered again. And that Jesus is the son of David. He is the Messiah, the son of David. That's the angle for Matthew. Now if we go down to Mark, let's turn to Mark. What's Mark's full name in the Bible? Anyone know? I heard it. John Mark. Have I got it? Oh, I've got it. I'm glad you're reading your notes. I'm glad you've... Well, behind attention there. Let's turn to Mark, chapter 14. Now, every author in those days tried to put themselves... If they were an eyewitness, they would try to put themselves into the story. So Matthew put himself into the story. There he is at the, the booth. He gets called by Jesus. Mark, on the other hand, 
uh, does not appear by name anywhere in any of the Gospels, but he does appear in a rather odd little story, or I think he appears in an odd little story, that appears in none of the other Gospels. Verse 48, so Mark 14, 48. And this is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus answered and said to them, that's the guards, Have you come out against, um, out against me with sword and with club to arrest me, as against a robber? Every day I was in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But this has happened, that scriptures might be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And a certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen sheet over his naked body, and they seized him. But he left the linen sheet and escaped from them naked. Not the first streaker in the Bible. But a lot of people think that that was John Mark. Um, they also believe that John Mark's um, mother um, was actually the person who owned the upper room where the Last Supper was held, where the spirit fell afterwards, where the disciples met, effectively the first house church in the Bible and he because they talk about John Mark in the the epistles in the book of Acts so it was lucky he was a small child or a boy a young boy at the time and if he was in that upper room at that last supper and all the others went out did he sneak out of bed wrap a sheet round him and follow afterwards so in that sense he was an eyewitness to some of the events that went on specifically in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane if that is true. I think it is, but once again, you can make your mind up about that. Now, John Mark is supposed to have been the, as it were, the, the, the scribe who spoke, who talked with Peter, and Peter told him a lot of the events that happened, and John put him down. A lot of Mark and a lot of the Gospel of Matthew are almost word for word the same, and the events and things like that. So whether he listened to all the stories and he heard from them and he wrote them down, that may well be the case. Um, in the book of Acts, he's mentioned he starts off going with the apostle Paul and Barnabas and he gets to Cyprus, I think it is, and he goes back, which gets Paul rather upset because Paul likes people who are very, very into the mission. And I think John Mark was obviously at that stage quite young, got homesick maybe, went back home. Paul got upset with him and later on that actually ended up with an argument between Paul and Barnabas because Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with him. Paul was going, no, I want someone who's reliable and he didn't take him. At the end of Paul's life, he says, get John Mark to me. He's a good chap. He's useful. So in John Mark's case, he grew up in the Gospels. So in the time of the Gospels, in the time of the Acts, he grew up during it, starting off as a young man, almost a child and growing up through it. Mark's Gospel um, was probably written to the, the Romans through Paul, uh, through, through Peter, sorry. And it's, it seems to present Jesus as a servant. It doesn't start off with his birth. Why do you need to know about the birth of a servant? So there's no story about him being born. And there's a word that keeps appearing again and again in Mark, which is straightway, or straightway, or immediately. The Romans' ideal form of man was someone who was given a job, went off and did it, straight away, efficiently, and come back and reported it was done. So that's what they give to their, to their generals. Go and defeat this country for me. Yes, sir, off they go, defeat it, come back, well done, have a triumph. Or to a slave, here's the job, go and do it. And that was their, it was, imagine the sort of Victorian era, everyone's very straight back. There's the job, go on and do it. Impossible job, totally impossible. Go and do it. Sort that out. Yep, come back. Good man. That was it. And what we see in Matthew again, or in Mark, sorry, again and again and again is that word straightway. So a job comes along straightway, immediately. Jesus goes and does it. Sorts it out like that. No messing about. Another symbol of Mark, which is traditionally given, is the ox. And the reason is the ox. Uh, was used for ploughing. It is considerably stronger than any human being, and if it wanted to, it could kill any human being, and yet it is the servant of man. 
It's what's used for ploughing. It's what's used in, in strength. So traditionally, the ox has been used as a symbol. And the, the, the story in Mark is Jesus the Messiah, the servant of God. So can you imagine Jesus is sent down to effectively be a servant to the people he's saving, to die on the cross. God gives him a job, I want you to go and die on the cross to save people from their sins. Okay, immediately he went and did it. No messing about, no prevaricating. He taught what people needed to be taught. He set the church up as he needed to set the church up. He died straightway. So from the Roman point of view, is the Son of God doing the, jo the job that God has given him straight away as a servant. Now the book of Luke. Now Luke, the beloved physician. He appears in the book of Colossians. That's how uh, Paul describes him. Paul, we know, probably suffered from quite a few different ailments. And Luke meets up with him. I think, I can't remember whereabouts, he meets up with him and travels around with him. Luke is not an apostle. He was not there during any of the events that happened in the life of Jesus. Um, and he has said that, that bit I read earlier on, he said he was not a, a, an eyewitness, but as he travels around, he talks to a lot of the people who were eyewitnesses. And it's noticeable in the book of Luke, um, there's a lot more from ladies' points of view. So there's a lot more of what Mary thought. There's a lot more... Um, He's obviously gone round and talked to people, and he's obviously talked to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and he's found out things that she thought, where Mary said, and she, Mary kept these things in her heart. How would he know that unless he had spoken to her? So he's obviously meeting up with Mary at some stage during his travel. Um, the tradition is that John, obviously John, we know John the Apostle took her into his household, and I believe the tradition is she went to Ephesus. Whether he met her there or not, I don't know. But, so from the point of view of Luke, he, see, we, he gets, he's done a systematic survey. He's a doctor. He's, I suppose, closest we could get to a scientist in those days. Someone who systematically goes through things, finds things out. And the main important thing is he said he's written his gospel in chronological order. The others do not claim that. Um, the tradition at that time was that you could lump together events that you want to show your case. So there's a, a chap called Suetonus, who's a, a Roman um, author, who was writing about the, the ten Caesars. And what he would do in each life, each of the Caesars he was looking at, he would take certain events and lump them all together to show how, he was, how this Caesar was a, a child of the gods, or these are all his victories, or these are his faults. And he would lump them together like that. So... The gospel, and that was traditional at that time. So, for instance, the Gospel of Matthew puts together a whole load of events that weren't in chronological order, but they put them together to show a certain aspect of Jesus' life. Luke specifically says, I've searched it out, I've checked it, and I've put it in chronological order. Because the Greeks, on the whole, liked things in chronological order. So that's what he's done. And it's mainly for a Greek audience, so... Medicine was, uh, I suppose, uh, started with the Greeks as such. And so that was his thinking. Now, Luke may have been a Gentile, but there's also some thinking that he was actually a Jew of the dispersion. So those Jews, like Paul, who was born in Tarsus, Luke was born somewhere else. Because several of the words he uses show a very deep understanding of the Jewish religion. So whether he's a Jew, whether he's a Greek... I don't know. But certainly he travelled with, uh, with Paul a lot and he met up with other people. He actually appears in the Gospel of Acts. If you turn to the Gospel of Acts, to, or sorry, say Gospel of Acts. I call it the Gospel. Um, some people have described it as the Acts of the Risen Christ. So this is what Jesus did after his resurrection through these people. So if we go to the book of Acts... So Luke writes himself into the book he's writing. Not by name. 
Uh, so Acts chapter 20. One to six, see if you can see where he appears. And after the uproar had ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and when he had exalted them to take, uh, to take leave, leave of them, he departed to go to Macedonia. And when he had gone through the districts and had given them much exhortation, he came to Greece. And there he spent three months. And when a plot was formed against him by the Jews, as he, as he was about to sail for Syria, he determined to return through Macedonia. And he was accompanied by uh, so, uh, Sophia and Bera, the son of Pythus, Pythus, and a lot of other people. And at five, but these had gone ahead of head, head and were waiting for us at Troas. Waiting for us. So this is where Luke, or the author of this book, joins in the story. So up to this point, Paul's been travelling. He says, he went here, he went there. And now it's, we went here, we went there. So this, he writes himself into the story, but once again, not by name. We know the name from one of the epistles that Paul wrote later on. The symbol of Luke is a man, the ideal man. And that was to the Greek mind, the, the ideal man. You know they made their sculptures of the ideal man, all muscled and honed and all the rest of it. But it was also ideal man in the mind, the thinking, the way they behaved, all that type of thing. And so Luke presents his gospel as Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of Man, the ideal man. And he's writing that to a, a Greek audience, and that's the type of thing they're looking for. Let's go on to John. John is different to all the others. Who's heard of this expression, Boanerges? Have you ever heard that? The Sons of Thunder. Um, Jesus nicknamed James and John's Boanerges, the Sons of Thunder. And you can imagine what those boys were like. So, when, J when James and John came into a room, I would imagine the volume lifted. These were guys who wanted to get things done. These were the ones who were making the racket. These were the ones who, had, who really got upset or they got, got emotional and got out there. Um, when I was young in my church I grew up in, there was a band, a Christian band called Bow and Urges. They weren't very good, but they were loud. <laughs> that was the vicar's son and a few others that were involved in that one. Um, so I remember that name. But anyway, so that's the nickname that Jesus gave to James and John. The sons of Alfie, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, sorry. Um, once again, this book is not mentioned as being written by John, but seven times in this book there is a mention of an unnamed disciple who was involved closely with what was going on. So can you remember that the disciple that was laying in Jesus' bosom at the Last Supper? Remember that expression? That means they, were, they laid diagonally on the floor. And the person, so if Jesus was laying like this, the person who was laying on this side was laying in Jesus' bosom. Because he was directly behind him. And interestingly, the person who was on the other side of Jesus, here, who would have been the guest of honour, was probably Judas Iscariot. Because when Jesus took the part of the dip to give, because um, it's part of the, the host's job, to take uh, a specific part of the meal, and hand it round to everybody, the first person he would have given it to was the guest of honour. And that, they describe it as the sock. Who I give the sock to, he is the one who will betray me. And he gives it to the guest of honour. The reason all the disciples didn't jump up and start killing Judas at that point was that Jesus would then have given it to all the others in turn. But the first person he would have given it to would be the guest of honour, which is why people say it was Judas. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. And at that point, everything goes quiet because everyone's listening to us now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, seven times there was a mention of an unnamed disciple. At the end of the Gospel of John, it basically says that unnamed disciple is the one who wrote this book. 
And we know that it was one of the close disciples of Jesus. It was one of the people in the boat when they threw the net on the other side. It was one of the people um, who, who saw the... Um, so who was at the Last Supper and things like that. So there are seven Pacific mentions, which is not surprising because the whole of the book of John is built around the number seven. There are seven signs or seven miracles. There were probably thousands of them that Jesus did. He's only recorded seven. There are seven discourses, which is like long sermons, like mine, when Jesus goes on and on and on forever. <coughs> there are seven specific ones of those. There are seven statements of I am. I am the bread of life. I am the, 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 the light of the world. I am being the name of God. And so, so he puts seven of those in there. And once again, seven mentions of the unnamed disciple. And it's all built up in seven. It's a very, I won't say contrived gospel, but it is well thought out and well constructed. And there's the conflict of light and darkness comes in the book of John all the time. And you'll see that as you go along, and in a little while you'll see why it comes in there. But he's very much on light and darkness. For instance, when Judas leaves the Last Supper, it said, and he went out and it was dark. Well, of course it's dark, because the Passover is always held after dark. But from their point of view, they saw Judas get up, go out of the candlelight, leave the presence of Jesus, and vanish into the darkness. From the spiritual point of view, you can see what's going on there. He left the light of Jesus and disappeared into the dark. You don't need to say it's dark, because of course everybody knows it's dark at the Passover meal, or the Jews would have known. But that is something that he specifically brings out. And there's lots of things in the book of John that brings that out. Um, the symbol of John is the eagle. The eagle of Patmos. And that's what he's described as. Um, for the eagle in the Bible is the symbol of God. And to the Greeks as well, interestingly, because they always have <coughs> their um, prophets and things, they would look up and see which way eagles were flying and make decisions on that. If an eagle flew down one side or an eagle flew down the other side, that mattered to them. But in the Bible, specifically, and we're talking about the Bible here, God said I, to the Jews, I brought you out of Egypt on eagle's wings. So it's the power of God brought you out. And so the power of God was often symbolised by the eagle soaring above them. So you've got four symbols. The lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. And what does that remind you of? Uh, Two weeks ago, I was dressed up as Indiana Jones down the front there and told you all. Did you? Yes. <sighs> Let's turn to the book of Revelations. The so, um, I don't know. So, Revelation chapter 4. And after these things, I looked and beheld a door standing in heaven. And the first voice that I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking, said to me, Come up here, and I will show you the things that must come, come to place. Immediately, I was in the spirit, and behold a throne standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who sits on it was like Jasper, and a Sardis in his appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in the appearance. And around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and upon the thrones were twenty-four elders, sitting clothed in white garments, with crowns on their head. And from the throne proceeded flashes and lightning and peals of thunder, and there were seven lamps for a burning in the throne of God, and seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea like the crystal. Remember I talked about that window looking down. So the crystal sea is a window looking down to earth. And in the centre around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. And the first creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf. And the third creature had the face that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living, uh, four living creatures, one of them having six wings and full of eyes around and within, day and night do not cease to call out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. 
probably quite an impressive sight. Four faces. The lion, <coughs> the ox, yes. the, e the man, the eagle. Yeah, that's the gospel. If you think of that about the throne of God, it's like a, a coat of arms. It's a living coat of arms above the throne. And what that shows you is, so any coat of arms, if you look at that, it's supposed to tell you about the person whose coat of arms it is. And you look at certain things about it and it will tell you what it means. This is a coat of arms telling you about the character and personality of God. And in the Old Testament, in Ezekiel, we have the same thing. We have this, if you, if you remember Indiana Jones telling you, great big chariot coming along and four mighty angels. Each of them actually had these four faces as well and were travelling along. So it's like an enormous, it's, it's a living coat of arms of the character, the personality of God. So what you have in the four Gospels is the character and personality of God put into words. So each one of the writers, or God through the writers, is saying, that's that side of my personality. 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 It's not everything that Jesus did. It's not everything he said. But it's what God wants us to know. Let's just go to Ezekiel for a minute. I'm adding another character into the mix here, on the other end of the spectrum, if you like. Ezekiel 28. This will probably give, possibly give you a new insight into a certain character in the Bible. We don't talk about much nowadays. Now, this specific prophecy is given about the, 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 the city of Tyre, which is on the coast of the Mediterranean, slightly higher than Israel. And it was a very big city, very powerful, caused Israel a bit of problem every now and again. For instance, um, uh, Ahab, Jezebel, Jezebel came from Tyre. Starts off the prophecy. I've got it so that the, um, the king of Tyre was overthrown on the beginning of mine. It starts talking about the, the princes or the, the leaders of Tyre. And it starts giving a prophecy against them. Now, in the Bible, um, David, when God was talking about David, he didn't talk about him as the king, he talked about him as the prince of my people. <coughs> the idea was that God was the king of Israel and that whoever he put in charge was the prince of the people. That's how the way officially, as it were, God would refer to people. So when God starts talking about the princes of Tyre, what he's talking about is the, people, the physical human beings who are in charge of the city. But then he starts talking about the king of Tyre. Let's go to verse 11. See if you think this is about a human being. So 28, 11. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus saith the Lord God. You who had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, ruby and topaz and diamonds and bells and onyx and jasper, lapis and uh, lazuli and turquoise and emeralds, uh, the gold and workmanship of your settings and the sockets was on you. On the day that you were created, they were prepared, and you were anointed the cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were in the holy mountain of God, and you walked amidst the stones of fire. Is that a normal human king? Possibly not even a uh, Donald Trump regards himself <coughs> as quite that high. That's talking about not the human rulers of Tyre, but a spiritual ruler of Tyre. And it's not God, but it's someone that God created. I cre the day you were created, and it's someone who was the cherub that covers. Now those angels who were over the throne were cherubs. Cherubs have six wings, by the way. You can tell a cherub, if ever you see a cherub, they've got six wings, right? <laughs> One day we will. One day we will. This person was a cherub 
who was in that position, who was one of those, possibly the one of those four faced beings over the throne of God, who then fell. Any ideas? Satan. So at that time, Satan was in personal command of the city of Tyre. Satan does not go everywhere. Well, not God. He's not like God. He's not omnipresent. He can only be in one place at once. So it would be interesting to know which part of the world he's in charge of at the moment. Not necessarily the area we've got the most problems. Because he's working on the next one. He can leave that to his underlings to sort that out. But what I'm showing you here, Satan, once upon a time, was the living emblem of the perfection, the character of God. And he fell from it. And now, along comes this chap Jesus, who is the living embodiment of the perfection of God. I think there's a grudge match coming along here. Satan fell. He's got something to prove with Jesus. Quite apart from any judgment to come, he's got, there's, there's a personal niggle here. There's a, he was that thing. He fell, and the Bible says it's because he wanted to be praised. He wanted to be like God. So instead of being the, the living image of God and giving praise and worship to God, he decided he wanted to be God and fell. So when it comes to the dealings between Jesus and Satan, there is this thing in the background. Jesus wasn't multi-wings, flying above. He was a normal human being, but his character had these four aspects. That's the warm-up. Let's go to the beginning, shall we? And we're going to the first, first chapter of John. In the beginning. Actually, we're not going to get to any of the life of Jesus by the end of this session. I'm just warning you. So any questions on that first bit before I proceed? That's okay. I, I will send it on to you. That's all right. Understandable. John, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Easy question, what's that relating to? Jesus, yep. What section of the Bible is it relating to? Genesis. Let's go to Genesis. As I've got it written up there already for you. Keep your finger in, John. The first verse in Genesis, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. In the beginning was the word. So the first thing, if you had been on the surface of the earth, you would have heard is the word of God. Let there be light. It's interesting that starts at the beginning of John, who talks about the difference between light and darkness. So that's why he's got this theme of light and darkness in his Bible. He starts off with this. So you can see the connection. It's a fairly obvious one. Um, Go back to John. Word. Now, it's come down to us in Greek. The word in Greek is logos, which means uh, thought, intelligence, that type of thing. Um, on the whole, John was not a Greek philo philosopher. He was a Jewish fisherman. So, although he may have been aware of the idea of the logos, that's not how he would have been taught. So... If you look into Hebrew, the word is devar. There's two different spellings I've found so far. Um, 
the Aramaic word, which is what Jesus and the disciples would have spoken, is memra, um, which is an important word in the Bible, the memra of God. The word, it's the word of God. And that appears an awful lot of times in the Old Testament. So devar or memra in the Old Testament of the Bible. Can you think of the expressions, and the word of the Lord came to this prophet, or the word of the Lord came to that prophet? And there's a few examples here. So if you look at Genesis, uh, we won't read them out. Uh, Genesis 15. Um, the word of the God came to Abraham and spoke to him. Uh, in Psalms, the world was created through the word. So that's what we've seen in, obviously, Genesis to start with. God spoke. Sometimes it said, the word of God runs swiftly. So you can imagine sort of a messenger running along. So God sends his word, just like King David. They sent, Joab sent a messenger to King David who ran along to him. So the word runs quickly. Um, at one time, the word of God is sent to fall upon Jacob. And that's judgment. So, so to fall upon somebody is to, um, to do them over. So in that particular case, when Israel... Israel, who was represented by the name Jacob, was doing up to something. God sent his word to fall upon them. So they were in trouble there. The famous one, the, my word shall not return to me empty. Have you ever heard of that one? Yes. Um, often used by preachers. So when they're standing up the front, preaching away happily, in the back of their minds is, oh, please Lord, let your, not your word come to empty, because I'm looking at everybody here and everyone's asleep, type thing. But when God says, I want this done, it's going to be done. And if he sends out his word to do a job, that job's going to be done. Um, the word came to Ezekiel. So that's when that great big vision came to Ezekiel to start with, the great big chariot with the four angels. He said the word of God came to Ezekiel. Um, next one. Uh, you have seen that I have spoken to you. That's in Exodus. Let's turn to Exodus. That's a good one. Exodus chapter 20. Given of the Ten Commandments. A lot of things go back to the, the giving of the law. Uh, 22. So 2022. 20, Hold on. That's Genesis. Wrong. Exodus. Moses had gone up the mountain, told God that everything was ready, and God said, right, go back down again. So Moses traipses down the mountain again, and when he gets to the bottom, God then speaks the Ten Commandments out loud to everybody. They reckon about two million people. So two million people heard God speak these commandments. People said, please sir, I'm scared, please let Moses speak to you and we'll listen to him. Um, so, which verse are we on? Chapter 22. And the Lord said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, you yourselves have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. So this is the word of God being spoken to them from heaven. You've seen it. You've seen the lightning. You've seen the thunder. You've heard the voices. You've heard my word. The same word that created the world. You have heard it. And now I'm telling you, Moses is going up there and talking to me. What he comes down to tell you will be my word. So that was quite important. Let's go to Deuteronomy. Chapter 18. <coughs> so chapter 18, 18 and 19. And this is God speaking later on about this incident when the people are too scared to listen. And the Lord said to me, this is Moses talking, they have spoken well. I will raise up a prophet from amongst their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth. And he will speak to them all the things that I command him. And it shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he is speaking in my name, 
I will require it of him. So the person who is like Moses, the prophet who is like Moses, who speaks to God face to face, who has the word of God put in him, who is to come to the people, and the people, there will be some who listen to that word, there will be some who do not listen to that word, and that will be required of the people. Which is why that particular generation that rejected the word of God were judged, because that was the warning was given here. Jesus is the prophet like unto Moses, who has the word of God in him. But more than that, he is the word of God. I do not understand the Trinity. Nobody does. How can you have God and Jesus and the Spirit being one person and separate? I don't understand it, but I accept it. When you stop arguing and don't accept it, that's the JWs, for instance, don't accept Jesus was the Son of God. Same with the Mormons and things like that. It all changes around. That's how it goes. So the, the, the Gospels <coughs> show Jesus as the Son of God, as the Word of God. <coughs> Now, is this just us looking back now, thinking, oh, I'm reading back into this. Hindsight's a wonderful thing. You get 20-20 vision with hindsight. Is it possible that the Jews did not understand this at the time? If you look down this next bit, who's heard of the Targum? Targum, yep, that's us. Some people have listened to the same teacher who I've listened to, so we'll know all of this. The Targum. This was, uh, have you ever heard of the amplified version of the Bible? So it's where they would not use one word, well 20 will do. So, so it uses all the words, it's like having a synonym, a syn- um, if you look up a synonymous word. It's got all of those words and it will try to explain the Bible with using as many words as possible. Um, the Targum is a version of the Bible like that, but written in Aramaic. And it comes from little events that happened in Nehemiah. So if we go to the Gospel, of, uh, so the book of Nehemiah. It's chapter 8. People of Israel have returned from exile to Jerusalem. Um, they've rebuilt the walls, they've rebuilt the temple. And now they're going to rebuild the spiritual worship of the people. And the chap who's responsible for that is a chap called Ezra, who is a priest who's returned. Um, And Ezra, basically, they they get the scrolls of the law, which are written in Hebrew, which now most of the people don't speak. Because these entire generations of people who come back have been living in uh, Syria and Babylon where they speak Aramaic. So they've come back and they don't understand the, the Hebrew. But he wants to rebuild, he wants them to learn so if we go to uh, chapter 8 verse 5 actually we'll start from verse 4 and Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden podium which they made for the purpose and beside him stood a whole load of people Um, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people who were standing above him and all the people and when he opened it, the people stood up This is going to be a long reading, so they were standing for a long time. And Ezra blessed the Lord God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed low and worshipped the Lord, their faces to the ground. And also, Yeshua, Bani, and a whole lot of other people, um, and the Levites explained the law to the people, while the people remained in their places. And they read the book of the law, um, translating it and giving sense to it so that they could understand the reading. So what these guys were doing was translating it into Aramaic. So as the Hebrew was read out, they would then translate it into Aramaic. We'll come back to that verse 7 in a while. So the Targum is a, a written version of that translation, if you like. But it is more than a word-for-word translation. I like to get as close to the original text as possible. So, I do not like reading from a paraphrase Bible on its own. A paraphrase Bible is where they, something like the message, where they get the overall gist of it, but doesn't come back to the original. Now, I like to have as close to I can as to the, the original. If I could read he- Biblical Hebrew, excellent, well done. But I can't. If I could read Greek, I can't. 
So I have to take as close as I can get it. This, what was happening in the, 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 the synagogues was these books that were written, they would read a line or maybe up three lines of the Hebrew scripture and then afterwards someone would read from different these, uh, these books, the Targon, they would read it in Aramaic and it would give a sense of what was actually being said in Aramaic. But it didn't follow a word-for-word likeness. So they had a habit of changing things. So if you look at the big green panel here, this is an example from one of these type of books that was read out officially in the synagogues. So at the top you've got the, the Hebrew with the English translation underneath it. At the bottom, the Aramaic with the Hebrew underneath it. So in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We've talked about that one. Underneath, the Aramaic translation found in the Targon, which would have said, in or from the beginning, with wisdom, the son of Yahweh completed the heavens and the earth. And these were read out in the synagogues at the time of Jesus during the services. So they would read a couple of verses and then someone would read one of these. And let's say the background to these, they come from the time of Ezra, where they, they would try to teach them, so they wrote these and they would write them out. Now, you can see why these are not popular with Orthodox Jews. The son of Yahweh. Yahweh is another name for, is the name of God. Also, we used to call it Jehovah. <coughs> out of, out of, out of uh, favour a bit now, now the Jehovah's Witnesses have nicked it. Um, but if you look at a version like that, that was commonly read out at the time in the synagogues. Afterwards, this has been pushed to the side a little bit. It still exists in Jewish literature. It's still there, but it is not orthodox. At the same time as this was being read out, the, the scribes and the Pharisees were, had what they called the oral law, which was their own versions of the law that they claimed Moses had given to the prophets, to Joshua and the prophets, and it was passed down to them. But none of it was written down at the time, and it wasn't written down for about another 200 years. If it's all written down, when it's written down now, it's about the size of the Encyclopedia Britannica. It's an enormous body of work. This is what this rabbi had said about this rabbi saying about this, and it's an enormous body of work. This was something separate at the time. Now, why I bring this in is because the Targum, in its trying to explain the Bible, changes a lot of the words. So sometimes in the, the actual word, it would say the Lord came, and it would change it to the word of the Lord came. Or um, God came to this person, the word of God came to this person. And it would change it. And the, the power of creation was the word of God. And things, it, it would change it. So that was the Jewish thinking of the time. So the word of God, or in, in Aramaic, the memoir, was an important concept that all Jews who went to a synagogue at the time of Jesus would have understood. And there's sort of six things that basically it says, which are on the right-hand side there. Sometimes the memoir was different from God. Sometimes it was the same as God. How can you have something that's different from God and same as God at the same time? The memoir was the agent of creation. The memoir was the agent of salvation. God takes on visible form in the memoir. Also the Shekinah. Remember what I told you about the Shekinah glory? They, they put the two together, the memoir, the word of God, and the, the glorious appearance, sometimes a cloud, sometimes fire, together. The agent of revelation, the word of God, came via the memoir. You've got all that idea. Let's go back to John. <coughs> As you read through, you will see all of these things being ticked off one by one as John's writing. And he did this absolutely on purpose. He covered them all. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. And the Word was with God. So that's the same as God, but not the same as God. And the Word was God. In the beginning, with God. 
All things that came into be, came to being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that came into being. Agent of creation. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines, and the darkness has not um, comprehended it or overcome it. Some of you have got. There came a man of God whose name was John. He came to bear witness that he might bear witness of the light and all might believe through him. So here's actually someone who was sent. Anyway. Um, he was not the light but came that he might bear witness of the light. There was the true light that came into the world enlightening every man. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own, so he was sent, and those who, who were his own received him, agent of salvation. But as many as received him, he gave the right to become the children of God, even those who believed in his name. Verse 14 we go up to, And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So in that first little bit of John, he is deliberately going back to the Targon, which was read in the synagogues every Sabbath, and he was ticking off the list for them. So what the Targon said about the word of God, he was ticking, tick, 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 like that, all the way through. This is important in as much as, in order to understand the, the life of Jesus, you have to understand the importance of these documents. Because it explained to the Jewish, this is what the Jewish people expected. It was explained to them, this was written, this is what's going to happen. And a lot of what was written in there happens in the life of Jesus. Which is why ultra-Orthodox ultra Jews have pushed it to one side and are slightly embarrassed about it now. But that's going on in there. I'm going to leave it there, I'm going to finish early. Um, next time we're going to start on the life of Jesus properly. What I've done though, I've added at the bottom there, actually no, I've missed an important bit, I've missed an important bit, John 14, John 14. I can't miss this one, I do apologise. John 14. I'll read this whole section. Last Supper, this is Jesus talking to his disciples. <coughs> Let your hearts... I do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way that I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to me, uh, no one comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. For now you, you, you know him and you have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, that is enough for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you that you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How do you say, show us the Father? In Jesus, you see the character, the personality of God in human flesh. You see the word of God made flesh. Everything about God is in Jesus. He is, as it were, a living cherub. Showing the personality. That is what is in the, th the four Gospels. That is what it shows the personality, the character of God. And God can get it in about that much, which is quite impressive. That's because he's God. That's not everything that happened, and when we get to heaven, I've no doubt we'll find out loads of other things, amazing things that happened. But that's enough. And that's quite enough to be getting on with in probably, well, nine sessions now. Whether I'll finish it by the end of this year, I don't know. But we'll see how much we get on. Uh, the references I was talking about at the bottom there, these are um, internet references, for those of you who've got the, the, 
The, the first one is YouTube references. I didn't know much about the Targon, so I had to look them up, and that was quite a useful reference. It told someone telling me and explaining different things about them, how they were read and the rest of it. Um, I haven't looked at all of them yet, but that was quite a useful one I looked at. Now, the next one, Our Real Ministries. Um, the first ultra-long one goes with an ultra-long piece of teaching. It's about 19 and a half hours, which some of us have listened to. And it is a lecture, basically, for 19 and a half hours by someone with the most boring voice in the entire world. <laughs> but when I first heard it, age of about 40 or something like that, um, my jaw was open for most of it. And I thought, why, how have I missed this? It's all been there. Uh, it's not as if it hasn't been hiding in plain sight. It's all there. It's just that the way we've been taught, yeah. and uh, so understanding of this Jewish literature, such as the Targum, such as the <coughs> things like that, when you put all that in place, it shows it up. Now, that long one, unfortunately, is a pay one. It's about 44 Forty-four dollars, if you want to buy it, it's American chat. Um, if you do listen to it, you have the advantage, you don't have to come and listen to me again. Because uh, he, uh, and you would also see how much I'm going to miss out in this, because I'll be picking bits out of it. Uh, he does have a free site underneath, which has got a lot of free teaching and things like that. It's slightly easier to listen to. Those are ones I would recommend for those who want to do more teaching. What I'll try to do, I'll try to give more things as we go along, so that if you want to study on your own at home, you can listen to them. Stephen, if, if you want, um, I have a resource centre with it and I then purchase certain things and I've got that that's available for anybody if they wanted to buy. Oh, right, so you've actually... Um, okay. I, I've got the whole of the DVDs. Yeah. On, on I know I've got all the... Because you gave me all the paper ones, didn't you? All the, the, the documents you gave me. Uh, that sounds yeah, I've, I've got the actual Life of the Christ, the Messiah, mm. sort of thing, DVDs, all the set that, oh, right, that so is that's... available to... Okay, right. With the DVDs, you have to stand and watch him as opposed to stand and watch me preaching, so I'm not sure which is worst, really. So, um, anyway, I will leave it there and finish early. Any questions before we go any further? Give up. No questions, you all want to go home, and I don't blame you in the slightest. Shall we finish with prayer? Father, we're starting on the greatest story ever told, the story of your son, the story of our Saviour, our Lord. Lord, help us and guide us through it. May your word guide us and be with us in your spirit and show us mighty things from your word. Amen. Amen.